Hey guys, it's Hunter. Welcome back to another episode of Ask Fish. It's the mostly weekly Q&A. Listen, I'm trying my best here. There wasn't an episode last week. In fact, there wasn't much content at all last week. I've been really enjoying uploading and interacting with the community more. I just need to find a workflow that's healthier and more sustainable. But anyways, don't forget to join our Discord server. The link is in the description. It's a great community. It's also where I pull all the questions from for these Q&A videos. Plus, we're doing a Smash or Pass series on your guitars. It's what I'll be filming right after this. Link to join that in the description. F that like button up if you're going to enjoy the video. That actually really helps out. And let's jump into your questions. Josh the Spooky asks, Billy Joe Armstrong's signature Epiphone got leaked. Thoughts? Dude, Epiphone is on a roll. All the signatures they were originally working on for release in 2020 are finally seeing the light of day, or at least are solidly confirmed now. Matt Hafey's models are being released sometime next year. Jerry Cantrell and Adam Jones as Paul's at some point. Kirk Hammett and Dave Mustaine have some thrash-inspired stuff coming again at some point. Billy Joe Armstrong, I'll be honest, I haven't listened to Green Day in a while. I think the last time I listened to them seriously, like, went through an entire album was... 2004, like when American Idiot came out. It's insane to me that they've been relevant for so long. I remember they were big even before that with uh, Minority. And on Spotify, Basket Case is their most played song, which came out in 1994. 30 years later, yeah, their sounds evolves a lot. They're still one of the most relevant bands from that, I guess, generation of pop punk. They still have very solid mainstream attention, which is really cool. So according to a Trogly video, and uh, by the way, if you haven't seen his Halloween special, he had me on to do some anime tier voice acting. The G-strings out of tune again! <laughs> but there's a new Billy Joe Armstrong model that leaked on Reverb. Set for 2022, it's a Les Paul Jr. in classic white, and it'll run you $750. Now, I'm a huge sucker for all things single cut, and I'm loving how clean that looks, even though it's got kind of like a dairy cow vibe. But that's a pretty hefty increase from the base model Epiphone Jr. in Tobacco Sunburst, which they're currently selling for $429. $750 is a lot for an Epi Junior. So besides the name on the headstock and the exclusive color, what's going on with it to justify a 42% higher price tag? Not a whole lot, to be honest with you. There's a hard case with exclusive graphics. Inside the hard case though, it's fucking leopard print. I'm so fucking sold on the case, holy shit. Epiphone does such a good job with their specialty hard cases. I'm so upset they don't sell the inspired by 1955 or in the 1959 standard cases with the pink plush separately because they are genuinely ridiculous and I love them. Back to the guitar, Billy Joe Armstrong's signature is on the back of the headstock, which is the only indication on the guitar that it's a signature model, which I like. I hate when there's huge graphics plastered all over guitar, like even though you own it, it's clearly someone else's guitar. This has a very classic look, classic white, in fact, that's stupid, we move. But yeah, other than that, spec-wise, it doesn't seem like there's anything special about this, at least according to this one listing, which to be fair, is pretty light on details. I was thinking that maybe since the Gibson version from 2008 had an ebony fingerboard in this color, maybe this would too. It in fact might, again, it's hard to tell from just one listing and just a few pictures. It says it's got a rosewood board, but Epiphone has pretty much stopped using rosewood in favor of Indian Laurel, and this fingerboard looks too dark for that. Indian Laurel is generally much lighter, so either the listing is correct and they're using rosewood as a special thing for this run, or it could be ebony, in which case, that makes this a lot more interesting. Even from Gibson, a Les Paul Jr. with an ebony fingerboard is pretty rare. An affordable one is even tastier. Still thinking of this as a cow, apparently. The other thing I thought they might do is change the pickup. The listing has it down as a single dog ear P90. Now, I hope it's not just an Epiphone one. Again, looking to the 2008 version, that had a Gibson H90, which is stacked double coil. They literally put one on top of the other in order to get rid of the 60 cycle hum. And that was a pickup Gibson actually designed through a collaboration with Billy Joe Armstrong. Apparently they sound quite different to a P90, closer to a humbucker because they do have those two coils. And you can't buy the pickup separately, you can only get them in those old signature models. So if they brought that back for just this guitar, that's a very exclusive feature, a major selling point to pick one of these Epis up. Another option is the Seymour Duncan Antiquity P90 that Billy Joe uses in his 1955 Sunburst Jr. Seeing as Jerry James Nichols signatures are carved top Les Paul Customs for the same price and 
uses a regular Seymour Duncan P90, some of that money saved on making a flat top non-cap junior could go towards putting in the higher priced antiquity. Point being, as it stands, if everything from this listing is true and they haven't gone with any exclusive features like an ebony board or a Gibson H90, and this new signature is just one giant missed opportunity, there doesn't really seem to be that much reason to go for this classic white junior. Like if I were in the market for a single P90 guitar, I'd much rather get a Jared James Nichols Gold Glory Les Paul Custom, ebony board, Seymour Duncan, and it's fucking gold for the same price. I'm still holding out hope because I mean, the listing is just not very detailed. So hopefully they're missing some key things. Fingers crossed because the guitar looks cool, but you know, I haven't seen a single shot of Billy Joe playing an Epiphone on tour. So it'd at least be nice to have some mods that bring it more in line with the guitars that he actually uses. And that's another thing that often comes up when you talk about Epiphone signature models. A lot of them can come across as cash grabs. Like Joe Bonamassa probably goes through a tub of hand sanitizer after he does the photo shoot for his signatures because you know he's going back to his horde of 59 standards when he's done with that promo. But they actually are great workhorse guitars. Matt Hafey of Trivium, Lee Malia of Bring Me the Horizon, they actually use their Epiphones on stage in the studio. You know, they're not toy guitars, they are professional worthy instruments. They're also obviously not Gibson custom shops. And it is cool to get affordable versions of the really expensive stuff, but it's undeniably cooler when you're buying the same guitar that professionals actually use for their job. Anyways, just some of my thoughts on the leaked Billy Joe Armstrong model and some of my thoughts on Epiphone signatures in general. Here's where I'll throw it to you. What do you think of the new Billy Joe model? Interesting, not so interesting. Do you wanna see a demo on the channel? And out of all the signature models that are drop in, what are you most hyped about? Jerry Cantrell, Adam Jones, Kirk Hammond. Personally for me, it's the Matt Hafey models, but what about you? I'm gonna have to get on these Kramer demos. That way I can ask Epiphone for more stuff to check out because they have a lot going on. Before we get into the next question, I wanna give a massive shout out to Jeffrey Wright and the rest of the amazing patrons that make this and every other video possible. I know you work hard for your money and choosing to use some of that to support the channel, it it really means a lot. All the Patreon pledges go to Luke for mixing the demo tracks or to Jordan and Connor for editing. So literally could not make content to this standard without you guys. So yeah, thank you so much. Into the next question. Dominic DeCoco asks, hey Hunter, have you seen Kyle Bull's video about a new 6505 reissue? What do you think of it compared to the 5150 reissue? from EVH. Kyle's an absolute amp nerd and I love it. So a quick TLDR if you're a bit more of a 5150 amp casual like me. The original block letter amps are considered the holy grail of 5150s and the current used market for 5150 type amps has gone insane. Meanwhile, you have two amp companies, EVH and PV, that are trying to capitalize on the block letter hype. On the EVH side, they're coming out with the 5150 Iconic sometime this month allegedly. Now, even though there's a ton of hype around this amp, no one really knows what the Iconic is really gonna sound like. It looks reminiscent of the original block letters, so the look, the name Iconic, it seems that they're trying to capture the original PV5150 sound, and it's got some sort of hybrid tube, solid state preamp section. It's 80 watts, which has never been done before for the 5150s, so the thing is retailing for $899 US, which is not only lower priced, than the rest of EVH's amp lineup, it's also lower priced than even the current PV6505. And then on the PV side, the 6505 is a completely unchanged circuit, and it's been that way for the last 30 years. It's just a rebrand of the original 5150 after EVH left the company. Now, it hasn't been officially announced yet, but it's basically a confirmed rumor that PV is refreshing the amp line. Finally, so as far as I understand it, the current 6505s will be replaced with 6505 1992 originals because more numbers is exactly what we needed with 5150 related amps. But 1992, that's when the 5150 was originally unleashed unto the world. So essentially with the 1992 original, as far as we can tell, PV is aiming for the exact same thing as EVH with their Iconic. Going back to the roots of the original block letter 5150 sound, but they're kind of taking the opposite approach. Rather than reinventing it and trying to make it more affordable to more players, they're upgrading the components. So original circuit, 
but they're gonna be using the same power transformers as they use in the Invective, which in turn was based on the best 5150 block loader transformers they could find. And, uh, well, no, that seems to be the only major difference. Uh, and it'll say 1992 original on the front panel. <laughs> so, the 1992 original kinda feels like a missed opportunity. PV haven't updated the damn thing in 17 years. And even then, it was only a rebrand from the 5150 since Eddie had started EVH and taken the name with him. But what's funny is that from the mouth of James Brown himself, the dude that designed the original 5150 and is now actually designing the iconic, the block letters don't have a different circuit to anything else. They just started using different tubes at about the same time they changed the front plate. So a lot of this romanticism around the block letter circuit is nonsense. What that means is that PV have literally been coasting on the same circuit for the last 30 years. So if you're gonna refresh it, why not take the opportunity to update it for the modern player and make a really solid case for picking the new one up. Better Transformers is cool uh, to the amp nerds and pretty much the amp nerds alone. And I'm not saying like add a full digital effects suite and a bunch of glowing lights and shit. People love the 6505s because they're affordable, they're simple, they're solidly built, and the tone kicks ass. But like, for example, 6505s are notoriously noisy. You can be doing absolutely nothing and the preamp will just be hissing like a snake in heat or something, we move. So a built-in noise gate would just make sense and they developed one for the invective that they could use here. Or a lot of guitarists these days record silently or run front of house. They've added XLR out with the dummy load into the 6505 mini head. Why not bring that feature to the big boy 6505? While you're at it, the tube safety indicator from the MH would be nice too. That last one, not a necessary feature, but a convenient one that doesn't change the spirit of the 6505. Because I don't know, to me, PV comes across as a company that's lost in 2021. A few years ago, they were at the forefront of the lunchbox head craze. Everyone only had great things to say about the 6505MH, the Classic 20. Three to five years ago, they were all over YouTube. The Invective launch was all the hype, but somewhere since, it has all gone wrong. That Undercover Boss episode was one of the biggest PR fuck-ups the industry has ever seen. Since launch, you're more likely to see the Invective's picture on the back of a milk carton than anywhere else. It's just gone missing, as has their social media presence. And I hate to be that millennial that's like, bro, in 2021, if you're not on social media, you don't exist. But companies in this space, it is very important to be connected to your audience. And for a company as large as PV, their social media presence is criminally poor. Like it is genuinely a class A felony how non-existent they are. And not just their social media, there's lazy and then there's whatever the heck their summer NAM showing was. And their answer to all that is same amp, better transformers. <laughs> Listen, don't get me wrong, I still want to try it because I don't have a regular 6505. Apparently it's more raw and aggressive and has more gain than a 6505 plus. And this 1992 original should end up being a better version of what's available now, but it's not exactly ambitious. Contrast that with the EVH, everyone is talking about the iconic. It's got a proper pristine clean channel. It's got a noise gate. It's got XLR DI out built in boost and it's cheaper than the PV. It remains to be seen how the tones will stack up versus the original circuit, but seeing as they're designed by the exact same guy, there's every chance it'll sound just as good, or even better, he's had 30 years of feedback. It could also be worse, who knows? I would love to find out. EVH, please, I'm begging you, respond to my emails. Yeah, so I guess the answer to your question is, I'm very hyped about the Iconic. I love how EVH is putting their own spin on a classic amp sound, it's updated, but it's not overly complicated, it's still in the same spirit of the original 5150 line. And on the other side of things, well, I'm gonna try to do my best to demo the new PV since it's gonna be essentially the first time they've ever updated this legendary classic. It's very safe in a time I think PV would do well to be more ambitious. Listen, as a guitar player, I want both amps to do well, but man, the EVH seems like a modern product while the PV just doesn't. But yeah, those are just my thoughts, I'll throw it to you. Between the iconic and the 1992 original, which one are you more hyped for and why? Or do you just not care? Amps suck, suck my quad cortex loser. What are your thoughts? Speaking of modern products though, but for your pants, as in your pants pockets, everybody calm down. The sponsor of today's video, Rich Wallet. If you don't already know, regular old wallets designed even before the introduction of the original 5150 block letter, 
They kind of suck. They're big, they're bulky, they tend to collect all this useless crap. You look through them and you're like, why is there an old McDonald's receipt from 2016 in here? So Ridge decided to do things differently. Super compact design with durable plates made of aluminum, titanium, or carbon fiber that can fit into your front pocket. They just sent me their new topographic location inspired by iconic natural locations. Earlier in the year, I visited Zion National Park in Utah. It is one of the most beautiful places in the world. And so I've been using the Narrows design with topography from the area laser engraved into the aluminum. That's super cool. And they've got a ton of designs to match your personality. They're even RFID blocking the thwart would be scammers from stealing your card information. I love mine. I'll never go back to a bulky wallet. I love the minimalism. So if you want to see why so many people are switching over to the Ridge wallet, head on over to ridge.com slash agrofish. If you guys, if you use the code agrofish, they'll give you 10% off your order. Free shipping and returns, lifetime guarantee. Check out cool wallets, embrace minimalism, and clicking the link supports the channel. That's ridge.com slash agafish and use the code agafish for 10% off your order. Now to the next question. Metal Leo asks, thoughts on the Gibson Adam Jones 79 V2 Les Paul custom and potential effect on the used market like the V1? Okay, a two-parter question, let's go. So probably for whatever reason, the most hyped Signature model of all time is getting a V2 release. If you're somehow unaware, Gibson and Adam Jones absolutely broke the used market last year with the release of the first run. I just found out today it's also stemmed a whole merch collection. You can get a $40 Adam Jones 1979 t-shirt or a $75 limited edition poster. I mean, it is shameless, but Go on, Adam Jones, get that bag. Version two is again based on his very cool 1979 Silver Burst Les Paul Custom, and this time it's limited to just 79 units worldwide, each numbered and hand signed by Adam Jones. Solid mahogany body, three piece maple neck, two piece maple top. I love the feel of Norlin Les Pauls. They're heavy as fuck. They've got the volute, the thin ish necks feel amazing. They're just solid, solid instruments. Personally, my favorite era. Norland style Gibson logo, so the B and O are closed, done by the Murphy Lab, so the hardware has been aged. There's a decent amount of finish checking on the top and on the back. The aged silver burst to start to golden. Also new to this version, there's custom artwork done by his wife Corin Fought on the back of the headstock. I mean, aesthetically, it is super cool. Then it's been modded to his specs, custom wild Seymour Duncan DDJ in the bridge, reverse mounted custom bucker in the neck. The bridge volume pot is a DiMarzio 500K, while the rest are regular CTS, so a lot of attention to detail here. Comes with a hard shell case and a headstock mirror, all for the bargain price of $10,000. Because of course, it's a Gibson Murphy lab. <laughs> what were you expecting? Cue the, ah, uh, Gibsons are so overpriced comments down below. Listen, Epiphone and Gibson versions are coming out. These were never targeted towards people like you and me. Let's all just chill out. This V2, it's a cool limited edition Gibson custom shop Les Paul. It's stupidly expensive as they often are. When it comes down to it, it's just fun to look at, and that's about it. I'll live vicariously through the people that can actually afford them over YouTube videos and forum posts. But what I've been trying to figure out is how on earth the hype around this model has exploded so much to the point where it's completely upended multiple parts of the used market. Let's be real here. They've got some good songs, but with one album in the last decade, it's not like Tool is an incredibly relevant band in 2021. This particular model is quite interesting. There's all this lore behind it with the 13 of them getting stolen from a Sweetwater truck. Silver Bursts are cool. 70s Les Pauls are cool. I mean, I've always thought so. I will gush about my Norlands to anyone that will listen. And I've loved Silver Bursts from seeing Matt Hafey of all people play one back in the day. But in general, for the longest time, 70s Les Pauls and Silver Bursts, they weren't really considered that desirable. Used to be able to get 70s Gibsons, even Les Paul Customs for so cheap. Nobody wanted them. They were considered the garbage Gibsons. Legit, on the used market, they used to be half the price of anything else. Now they're considered vintage and they're priced the same as everything else. I mean, just look at this one sold on eBay. I think this illustrates the insanity going on right now. Like that is not even a guitar anymore. Like actually, what the f there are 26 bids on this. It got up to $550.50 plus taxes and shipping, so it probably came out to something close to $700 for 
that. Silver Burst 2 weren't really that special. A lot of people even found them ugly. Like, they really weren't that desirable. Now, it's just insane. I was trying to pick up a husk of a Silver Burst custom early in the year, and the damn thing went for three grand. Actually, over three grand. Like, what the f for a husk? Honestly, though, I think most of the damage has already been done. A big part of the problem is that Gibson has never made that many Silver Bursts compared to other colors. For example, right now, you can't get a new Silver Burst Les Paul custom outside of these Adam Jones signatures. They've done a few limited runs over the years, but 79 to 83, that's when they were introduced and they made very few of them. So in 2021, if you were looking at an Adam Jones model and you couldn't get one, you were looking at Norlands to find an original Silver Burst. And that has actually generated a lot more interest overall for Norlands. Now you got people going, well, Actually, wait a second, Norland era Gibsons are quite good. Got everyone seeking after Norlands regardless of the finished color. Yo, people were making fun of me for spending just shy of a thousand bucks on the husk of the 74 custom we rest him on it. That seems like a pretty good deal now. But no, I think hype is already at its maximum. Firstly, from what I've noticed, the online reaction to this V2 has been much more subdued than that of V1. In fairness, the hype around V1 was insane. I don't know how anything would match that. But of course, you've got the scalpers who I'm sure have secured a decent percentage of the new run. But in terms of pure numbers, there's just a higher supply of Adam Jones models out in the world now. That's really the main thing, right? Like all the listings on Reverb for these silver bursts and everything, they're as high as they've ever been. Why they're not selling nearly as quickly, especially the ones that are five figures or approaching five figures, the most egregiously priced ones. So I think now with more of these guitars out there and scalpers having a tougher time flipping these silver bursts super quickly, we'll see the higher prices for the non-collectible silver bursts calm down a little bit, which will hopefully have a ripple effect. I can't see silver bursts in New Orleans going back to pre-frenzy price levels which is a massive shame for people like me that like to do rest mods on cheap vintage guitars. But at least it won't be the absolute insanity that we're seeing right now. And I think it'll only get better once the Gibson USA Adam Jones signature comes out, which I'm pretty hyped for, not gonna lie. And also the Epiphone Adam Jones custom. High-end collectors will always be high-end collectors. They live in a different world. But Gibson USA, Epiphone, those make Silver Burst more accessible, so you don't have everyone clamoring for the same exclusive models and driving the price up. Anyways, this has all gone a bit rambly. What do you think of the Adam Jones V2? And I'm curious about your thoughts. Like, why do you think that the hype around the Adam Jones models exploded so much? Gibson releases $10,000 Les Pauls all the time with cool specs, unique finishes. This particular one, for some reason, got everybody's attention. What do you think about that? But of course, this being the internet, while there's a shortage of affordable Silver Burst Les Paul Customs, there is no shortage of douchebags. It's time for the high praise of the week. And this one, it's not really directed at me. I mean, it is kind of. It was on my Squire Hello Kitty Evertune video. And I mean, it's just, you'll see. To me, it's stupid that grown ass men are collecting items and guitars clearly made for young girls to play on and making them some collector's item when they should just be hugely mass produced because I'm sure every little girl would hold their attention to playing or learning a guitar more and not throw it down five minutes after if it had the whole Hello Kitty thing going on dot dot dot. We know how girls are. <laughs> I'm annoyed that I can't buy my daughter one because some 30 year old fat guy that should be playing a Gibson or something manly is being sick and taking a child's guitar. Makes me vomit, to be honest. So, uh, wow. There's a lot to unpack here from the toxic masculinity to the casual sexism, back to the toxic masculinity, to just all around gross. So rather than unpacking any of that, we're just gonna pack it all back up and move on. And speaking of moving on, we're now at the end of the video. So in case you missed it, the latest episode of Nostalgia Fish dropped featuring my Fender Player Series Telly. Awesome guitar, best value Fender makes for just getting a no-nonsense modern Telecaster. Made it even better with some crucial upgrades and more importantly, found out what running it through the Angle Savage dropped a whole octave down to double drop D. Then using a slide would sound like epic as f 
as it turns out. Then, the Harley Benton Fusion was an absolute game changer in 2018. It was the guitar that sold me on the Harley Benton brand, stainless steel frets on a $350 guitar no one else was doing what they were doing in the budget guitar space. 2021, we're now on the third iteration of the series, but budget guitars overall have gotten so much better. Video of the Fusion 3 went up to find out if it's still the undisputed king of budget guitars, or whether another has taken the crown. Links in the cards if you haven't seen it yet. And the last one you might have missed, maybe the most perfect unboxing video ever on the channel. Three incredible boomer band guitars from three legendary American companies. Two brands I've never had on the channel before, and also the next Gibson Restamon project. I have to say, right now the unboxing videos are my favorite ones to make. It's just really fun to vlog and share with you guys all the cool shit that'll be on the channel soon. But for now, that'll do it for this episode of Ask Fish. Let me know your thoughts on anything discussed down in the comments. Like, subscribe, bell for notifications, all that stuff really helps out appease the algorithm gods. Plus, you won't miss it when I upload a new video. Social media, merch, and Discord server links are in the description. As always, thank you so much for watching. You've been awesome, and I'll see you for the next video.